Okay, I guess we can get started. I don't want to get you guys out of time. I'm afraid everybody's tired. Um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Kevin Dalton. I'm a retired police officer with Omaha in the narcotics unit. I retired, and about 10 minutes after I retired, my wife said, get another job. I retired you at home, and uh, so I ended up getting, I'm at the same desk I was when I was on the police department. I'm attached to the Metro Drug Task Force. So that's how I keep up on what's going on. Um, I knew about the federal problem uh, a year and a half ago. We knew it was coming. Uh, we knew uh, crystal meth, crack cocaine, and all that. We see all the trends. We know about it. That's how I kind of keep up to date. Um, basically, we won't, we won't have time to talk about all these drugs. But I'm gonna, I'll touch up on some of the bigger ones. But if there's a kid that, that lived in California that came to Nebraska, whatever drug he got in California, he could get here. Now, it might take him a little while to figure out who to talk to to get whatever drug he wants. But we have any kind of drug we want here in a while that we do in California. I don't know if it's because we're in the center of the country or Interstate 80, you know, I don't know. But, um, our young people have access to a lot of harmful drugs. I want to talk about barred out. Talk a little bit about fentanyl, methamphetamine, weed, and then during it all, we'll talk about some signs and symptoms. Does anybody know what barred out is? It's, it's a reference to alprazolam or Xanax. Here's from Urban Dictionary. Well, I'm from Houston, and barred out means messed up on Xanax bars. And that's what the, the bar looks like. Here's a better picture. And you can see where it's scored by quarters. Those are five milligrams each. And that's a, an appropriate dose for your uh, upset or whatever, 0.5 five milligrams. The young people are taking the full bar. There's a thing I found, it's tough to smoke weed in your parents' house because of the smell, but you can pop these alprazolam and Xanax and, you know, there's no smells, obviously. Here's a t-shirt, Blackout Boys. You can build up the tolerance, but ideally what you want to do is you want to pass out. And it takes three or four bars and you can pass out. Um, and I'll tell you about a student. Here's some of the t-shirts. Here's the one. When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Then use the lemonade to wash down the zen. I talked to a correctional guard at the youth center. And the guard said, this is all you got kids are talking about. Doing guard. Other t-shirts. There's the different colors. You hear anybody talking about culture? It's the green Xanax bar. is isn't any bigger. It's still two milligrams, but it's green. It's green. They do make a three milligram, but it's time release. It's not like that. So you do the full bar. You know, you're not doing the quarters or halves. It's the full bar t-shirt. So go online and you see all these people sitting their tongue out showing their bar that they're barring. She's got a tongue ring. That's what that thing is. So again, you want to black out, so that's the tattoo. Uh, you have four bars you black out. <coughs> we talk about um, uh, the dangers of snorting Xanax. What I read is that you don't get any higher snorting it, so I don't know why people would do it. But we had somebody uh, last month in Omaha, uh, police were called. Uh, the person said they liked snorting Xanax and other pain pills. Um, OFD had to administer Narcan to revive them to bring them back. Uh, you can see their age. They're born in 99, so they Then we had an incident at OPS last year in May, a high school student uh, overdosed and died. Well, we searched his phone, 
And there's pictures of him with his tongue out with Xanax bars. And his girlfriend, tongue out, Xanax bars. She's one of her friends passed out in the middle of the street. I wanted to show it, but I didn't think I should show it. Um, so he dies. During the investigation, we find out the person that's selling Xanax at the school is this kid's sister. Now we've got the problem when we talk to the parents. Hey, you know, your daughter may have aided in your son's death. Um, but it turned out on the uh, toxicology report which isn't uncommon, you start, especially with Xanax, but in the blood, you start mixing the drugs. And this kid did too. He mixed Xanax and fentanyl. He overdosed more likely from the fentanyl. Just decreased his heart and just stopped breathing. Um, I can't play uh, the sound, but I listened to a jail call. And girl's in jail, and she wants to talk to her sister at home, that dad can't wake her up. And the girl in jail said, well, she's all barred out. And so again, pretty common. Some of the signs of uh, Xanax, drowsiness, just like the dad couldn't get the daughter, his daughter up, uh, lightheadedness, sleeping for extended periods of time, Cognitive impairment, nausea, slurred speech, sluggish, um, all those symptoms. And you might say, well, that doesn't narrow it down, and it probably doesn't. But if you know your child, you know there's something different. And that's where you have to investigate. I've got some uh, up here. If you guys want to come up and see it later on. But a kid was uh, and the, and the mom actually lives pretty close to me. This happened a few years ago. Her son started using K2, and the mom knew right away there was something wrong because he was acting different. He drags him right into the doctor's office. He tests the son. He can't. With K2, you don't know what to test for. I can't find, he's not testing for marijuana, cocaine, but he continued acting bizarre to the point where the mom was going to hospitalize him. But before she could, he killed himself. But you will know um, if a friend or a child or whatever, you know how they act, where somebody else may just dismiss it. You can get online and see it. Um, there, uh, there's charts on all the different uh, symptoms for uh, Xanax abuse. They have some of a skin rash and all that kind of stuff. But again, where it says here, it says Xanax often uh, abused alongside other drugs, opioids, and alcohol. So that's, that's pretty common. If I should tell you that it's not a real uplifting presentation. Right? <laughs> it's depressing, and you know, that's the way it is. Fentanyl. Real briefly, I'll talk a little bit about fentanyl. Everybody heard about the big 33 pounds that was taken off the bus station. That wasn't for all of us. Our drug population could not use 33 pounds. That's one of the largest seizures in America. It was destined for the East Coast. But like I said, Nebraska, Omaha, we're in the center. Things are kind of coming and going. We're kind of a hub. So we've got other seizures, 18 pounds of fentanyl. So this isn't our own seizure of fentanyl. But to show you when they said how alarming the 33 pounds was, well, here's a, this is all lethal doses. That's a lethal dose of heroin. Then you see the fentanyl. That's a lethal dose. You took that and you And then the car fentanyl is even more lethal. So fentanyl, what it is, it's a synth synthetic opioid. Anytime you see synth synthetic, it's man-made. It's originally treated for severe pain, cancer patients. 
uh, where, where patients, um, they build up a tolerance to other pain medications. So then they were administered um, fentanyl because it's so much stronger. 15 to 20 times stronger than fentanyl. Here's a, uh, here's a pharmaceutical grade fentanyl. It's white powder. We don't know what it is. That's the issue with law enforcement. We can make a seizure at a bus stop, it could be cocaine. Um, and that turned out to be 33 pounds of fentanyl. We'd have opened it, and any of it would have came up in the air, it would have been an issue. The fentanyl patch, you can't abuse the fentanyl patch. Um, people have tried to smoke uh, the residue from it, scrape off the residue to get high. Um, we had an incident uh, a couple months ago. Somebody attempted suicide by putting on a whole bunch of fentanyl patch. And I told her, probably would have, uh, she would have succeeded in dying. Again, paramedics administered by So opioids, uh, drugs that uh, come from the opium poppy plant, which would include heroin, codeine, but it also uh, encompasses the pain medications. They're, they're opiate based. Uh, the oxycodone, the vitamin, uh, codeine, and the fentanyl. That's why if you can't get your vitamin uh, or uh, codeine or hydrocodone, and you need an opiate based medication. Heroin or uh, the pain's not going to help you, and that's not going to help you. The only thing that's going to help you if you can't get your pills would be heroin, and vice versa. Heroin is cheaper than some than the pills. That's why we're seeing a lot younger people starting to use heroin. Opioids, basically, it just um, it reduces, uh, it, uh, it blocks the, 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 the brain receptor cells, the pain receptor cells in your brain. So you don't feel pain, no matter how severe the pain is. And it's like, well, the doctor said it's like a natural cure. And it is. Can you imagine being in severe pain? You pop a pill, you're no longer in pain. You're ecstatic. And that's one of the signs somebody's starting to use pain restriction pills. They are very happy because they're no longer in pain. The problem is, after a few months, or if they start running out of their pain medications, they get really nervous. To the point where they're sweating, because, hey, I need to get more pills. But once I stop taking these pills, the pain's even worse. Not only do you have your initial pain, it could be even worse because you're not used to pain anymore, but then you've got the withdrawal problem too. So there's it's, you know, big issues. And they also say that um, you could be even more sensitive because you're not used to the pain. You might even weaken the bones. And another thing is, you know, if we all smoked weed, you know, 10, 20 percent of us would be addicted. With uh, opioid pain medication, so if we all took it. We all get addicted. That might take uh, someone six months. It may take me six weeks to get addicted. But eventually, if you keep if you kept taking them, you get addicted. Some of the signs of opiate uh, abuse, again, the elation, the euphoria, because, hey, you're happy. It makes you feel great. Um, you're also a little drowsy, depending on the dosage and your tolerance, you can be confused. I've got a slide about the eyes. That's kind of big. You can tell a lot by looking into somebody's eyes on um, the different drugs, um, if they're constricted or dilated. A lot of drugs you know, make your eyes red. It's been nodding off and all that kind of stuff. Other signs. Again, if you're running low on your opiate pain pills, you need to get them. So you may take off a Friday from work and go out of town to try to find another doctor, a doctor shop. Um, mood changes <coughs> dramatically. Social withdrawal. In the beginning, you love everybody. After a while, 
they don't really want to talk to anybody. Financial problems, things you used to like to do, you don't do anymore. There's a guy I you know, mother had surgery, given pain medication, oxygen, and she started abusing it. And you can tell right away because she used to do the garden, and the yard would look beautiful. He goes over to mom's house, and the yard's trash. She doesn't care about it anymore. You just don't care about other things rather than, than your own. Um, your friends that you used to have, I don't care about that. Um, sports, whatever your interests or hobbies, you kind of go to the wayside. Financial problems, because it, it is expensive. Withdrawal symptoms. Anytime I hear about somebody getting arrested, going to jail, heroin addict, or opiate addict, you kind of feel bad for them because it's cold turkey. It's not the same as hey, if I'm abusing coke and I go to jail. Yeah, I'll be uncomfortable. Even meth. Yeah, my body's worn out, uh, but I can detox. But with an opioid, you're deathly sick. And I don't have time, you can go to YouTube and there's a video of a guy talking about it. How his insides are just turned inside out, throwing up diarrhea, um, I mean, it's, you go through hell. Anybody, um, I can't think of the name of the press football player that uh, went on into the pros, Jason Christensen, was Jason Peters. He wrote a book about it and he talked about it. He, the nearest thing on health the living ever get to experience withdrawal from heroin. And he got injured, took pain medications, couldn't get pain pills anymore, went on to heroin. So, as you can see, the headaches, nausea, diarrhea, sweating, fatigue, anxiety, inability to sleep, all of that. And then we're seeing overdoses. Uh, these people live. We, we arrested the person that was uh, making uh, the uh, fentanyl and heroin in Omaha. We arrested kind of a group of them. But there's still more people out there. We had a girl that uh, she died in this guy's apartment out in Southwest Omaha. She's from uh, Southwest Iowa, 22 years old, fentanyl overdose. Stop breathing. Uh, common painkillers that will lead to heroin, again, Vicodin, Oxy, Percocet, Codeine, all those can lead to a heroin use. Heroin's like waking, heroin addiction, it's like waking up every day with the flu. You wake up, you're sick. So you take heroin so you're not sick anymore. Not really even high, you're just kind of maintaining your life. Um, we had a cop that uh, got in narcotics, a street uniform cop got in narcotics, grew a goatee, and uh, gets an informant that's a heroin addict. So um, the, the, the informant says, I can go into these houses, buy heroin for you, come out, give you the heroin, you can do the search warrant. So we go through the whole, he goes through the whole spiel, does the search, sends him in with marked money, comes out. But every day he meets the guy, he's always sick because he's a heroin addict. Well, one day he's actually sick. Um, he's got the flu. Um, the flu. Uh, the and he gives it to three officers. And one officer died after two weeks. Um, H1 had a lot flu. Um, but what he did because he's always sick, because he's a heroin addict. So, uh, we take a heroin addict. Yes, so now we got heroin addict. Um, everybody you know, tells you about how it's 50 to 100 times more than all that. And it is. It makes it a, a lot bigger high. Heroin addicts like it because the old saying, get hired by a truck. So if, if, uh, if all you're doing is taking heroin so you're not sick, now you've got a chance 
not to be sick and to be out. And they're going to take that risk because it's such a miserable life. All these people that get administered Narcan and revival, there's a person on the East Coast, they've died 19 times. And they've revived a the person, brought them back to life 19 times. You know what? They're pissed every time they get revived. They don't want to come back. Um, one, you've, you've uh, brought them out of kind of a high, but now they're back in a miserable state of heroin addiction. So, we always see these. This was in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. 32 hours, 52 people went into the um, emergency room. So, police chief gets out. No one used this heroin. The bad batch, it's got fentanyl, whatever. And what does that do? More people use it because they want to get high or die trying. Um, here's an incident that happened uh, just a couple months ago over at Walmart. The guy was acting really strange. Walmart people called on him. Cops show up. Um, he's got that uh, police with him. Um, his girlfriend has overdosed on fentanyl multiple times. It's been revived by her. And this is another one. Um, OPD, Des Moines Police, um, they got a grant, so now cops carry Narcan. But heroin addicts carry their own Narcan. They do heroin together, it's kind of a buddy system. So if I overdose, um, my heroin partner can give me the Narcan. So, and this went viral, this incident in Ohio. The, uh, the van's driving down the road and an off-duty cop is behind the van. The van's driving all over the road. So the cop gets on his cell phone and says, hey, get somebody over here and pull this van over. By that time, the van jumps the curb into the yard. So the off-duty cop gets out, goes up to the guy, hey, are you okay? My wife's sick, I gotta take her to the doctor. Well, my girlfriend's sick, I gotta take her to the doctor. So they're both overdosing on heroin. So the cop takes a photo of the grandson in the back seat. Well, it turns out the grand, it's the grandmother that's in the car. It's her, her grandson. The grandson was given to the grandmother because the son's mother is also a heroin addict. So now the son's been moved to someplace else. But the East Coast uh, has always been a mecca of heroin uh, addicts compared to other parts of the country. Ohio, it's really bad. They have a hard time getting um, companies there, have a hard time getting um, employees, because there's so many people in the Here's two nurses cleaning up an emergency room. And they must have moved the clothing of a fentanyl guy or something that got in the air, and the nurses had to be given hard care.
I found this on Craigslist. I was looking for something. And see this. Looking for a job. So I blew it up. I've been employed for six years. My dad helps me pay my bills. I'm looking for an easy job where I can work from home. I can probably do customer service on the phone. I need something where I won't be drug tested because I smoke every day. That's, you know, that's, unfortunately, you know, people say, well, marijuana's not addictive. Well, Randy Gregory, everybody knows who he is. He has lost millions and millions of dollars because he can't stop smoking. He's a, a professional football player. He's playing now, but he's, he'll never recoup what he's lost. Because it's just, again, it's addictive. And the issue is, and I'll tell you, it will come up here, how strong we do now. It's unbelievable. And having a young kid smoke it, where their brain's formulated or whatever, um, it causes some problems. We'll do the evolution of weed real quick. Um, the, what gets you high is the THC, the Delta 9, tetrahydrocannabinol. and all. That's what gets you high, the THC. So, ditch weeds everywhere. I had it in my backyard growing up in South Carolina. 0.5%. You cannot get high. You'll get a headache, but you're not going to get high. So you get over to the Mexican brick weed. You know, 5 to 8 to 10% THC. And it's like, you know, to a grand. And you can tell it's brick weed because it's compressed. You can see the corners. It's got the stems and the seeds. You can just tell it's been in brick. Then you get the hydro, the hydroponic. People are making it in Omaha, uh, in your basement. Uh, 15 to 20 percent THC. And look how much different it is. Very potent. Jump to hash oil. 50 to 60 percent. And you can, do, you can use the hash oil in the big And this is wax. 60 to 80%. And I have some up here not to use. Um, I've got something to show you if anybody wants to see it. Um, 60 to 80%. A month ago, I would have told you that's the strongest form of marijuana you have. But it's not. That's why I've got the extra space on my slide. We just found out about a new called THCA. 95 to 99% THC in this one. Uh, Tetrahydrocannabinolic acid. Uh, but you can kind of see it. It's, it's a crystallized form. Um, you'd almost think it was like crystal meth or something. But when you eat it, you don't get high. And it's supposed to be some of the medical benefits of weed. Marijuana. Once you smoke it at a certain degree, where it, where it melts, that's where the THC um, is broken up, and you have the THC at 95, 95, 95. Places where they're selling this, it's three times as expensive, but they cannot keep it on the shelf. People are buying it up the ground because it's too strong. People are getting away from smoking. You know, the marijuana cigarettes, bombs, going to the oils and the wax. Uh, they think it's more pure, and it is strong, too. Physical symptoms, bloodshot eyes, dilated constricted pupils. Here's one of the charts um, that shows, you know, for the marijuana, even for crack and stuff, um, red eyes. There's a guy I know that I was a meth user. He said he could go into a room and spot a meth user within minutes by just looking at their eyes. Another no thing is, is weight loss. Again, because you kind of stop caring about food. It's more about the drug. And your appearance changes. Um, you stop kind of caring about how you look so much because you got other things in your life. 
behavioral symptoms. Again, if your child or something you know, whatever, spouse or whatever, you have a drastic attitude of personality change, there's got to be a reason. When I was in the gang unit, uh, parents would tell me, yeah, you got involved in the gang because of the attitude change. Thing, you know, we would take, we would take uh, orders or whatever, or parents or teachers or whatever. Um, increased aggression, uh, kind of lethargic, or depressed, um, get different social network of people. You know, I, I know it's an old saying about you know, marijuana being a gateway drug, but if you get involved in any drug, you start hanging with people involved in other drugs. I'm not saying if you're, if you use marijuana, you're going to get heroin in it. No, but if, if you're smoking weed, you know who the weed people are. Most weed people know who can sell pills and what the dots and that work. Changes in habits. Uh, and it eventually, uh, I've had access to people's records. If I can pull up somebody's record, I can see when they were 13 years old, started running away, alcohol, weed, and then other crimes. You know, you, you can just see the pattern. And that's one of them. So, I mentioned K2 uh, as uh, a fake pot. And it's not even pot. It should not even be called uh, fake weed uh, because it's incense. And you know, 15 years ago, it wasn't as strong, and when you smoked it, it did kind of mimic weed. But now, it's like smoking LSD. And it's just sprayed with a chemical. And there's YouTube videos on it, people spraying their own chemicals on it, on the incense and flipping it over, and spraying it. You know, it depends how close you are when you spray and how long you spray it. Um, and you don't know what chemicals it is. That's why the mother took her son in. They didn't have to look at test for it. There's a football player, Chandler Jones, all-star, or all-NFL pro. He doesn't want to get tested for weed. So he starts smoking synthetic weed. And he goes crazy to the point where he goes down to the police station in the middle of the winter without his shirt on. He kneels down in front of the uh, on-duty sergeant, puts his hands behind his back, or his head, and he's shaking, and he doesn't know what's going on. It's the synthetic weed. He did it because the NFL couldn't test for it. And if you get tested for weed in the NFL, you lose games, and he probably makes a half a million dollars every game. So that's, that's the scary part about it. And we had a U.S. attorney in, in Omaha go to China where it's made, talk his way into a factory. And there's a conveyor belt with all this pop or incense, and people are spraying, and they're all wearing hazmat suits as they're spraying. It's illegal in Omaha. We passed a law. Um, if, if there's a store selling it in Nebraska, they can be fined two to ten thousand dollars for every package. Nobody's going to risk that. So you cannot buy it in Nebraska. We should cross the bridge in Iowa. Council of Wilson did it. We did it online. Here in July, we did a search warrant. Um, oh, no, this is um, back in July where a kid overdosed, and Justin K2 falls off, stretches in on the concrete, breathing heavily, rambling speech. So we, here's the law that was passed. I'll be telling my, like I said, two ten thousand $10,000. Here's a seizure in March. I mean, two grams of K2, cash and a firearm. I mean, we, we still have them, we just can't go to the store and buy <coughs> Crystal meth, if I had to tell you what's our biggest problem just based on the number of people that we arrest and how much meth we seize, we'd have, we'd have to say meth's our number one problem. Because we seize. You know, hundreds and hundreds of pounds a year. You know. Here's a, uh, a lot of a lot of property crimes are 
associated with that piece. Here's my daughter called me and said, hey, do you see Matt? Do you see Matt on the news? Uh, she went to school and he thinks about that. He actually, he actually wanted to take, take her out. <laughs> but if you can see here, they were doing breaking into homes, they were breaking into cars, stealing checks, credit cards, making their own kind of cash. Anything you could do just to see their methods. This is you know, very, very common. And it's 99% of crystal meth. Um, I got Yeah, I have some. And uh, if I can get it back, I'm going to show it to you. <laughs> but just to have you look at it, because it looks a lot different than a crack. See what it looks like, and then I'm going to tell you too. Uh, and then you just take one of those little shards, you put it in the pipe, and you light it. Um, now, just a little tidbit: he's not smoking crystal now. He's smoking crack. I know that because he's used a big, big pipe. Smoke crystal now. You need a, uh, a simple, a lighter, a, a hotter heat source. So what I'm passing out is a quarter ounce for seven grams. At one point, it was 500 bucks. Gone down 350. That's probably less than 200. In the time, in the few years I've been doing it, that's how much effect we have on the the price has gone down. How long does it last? Um, the guy that used to do the talks with me, that was the meth addict. In the beginning, it's like any drug. It's like alcohol. You know, you start drinking one can a night, you move up to two cans, or a six-pack on a weekend. Initially, when you start doing crystal meth, that would probably last you, you know, four or five days a week, to the point where you could do it in one day or less. It just depends how you build up your tolerance, how much you want to do. The guy that used to do the talks, go right through that. So, and then the issue is, once the bottle's empty, you just start kicking the doors and steal whatever you can. So why is it so tough to stop using now? It's chemically designed to make you feel unbelievable. People I've arrested said, as soon as I'm out of jail, I'm going back to the People that were using crack cocaine, they stopped using crack because meth is so much stronger. It lasts longer and all that. You tell me, it makes you feel like Superman. Um, other people say, hey, you know, I started doing it because it's an appetite suppressant. Uh, you can lose a lot of weight. Uh, we had an OPS teacher. She started doing it for that reason. Then started dating her meth dealer, then he starts selling it on school property. Um, and they both went to prison. It is like Viagra on steroids, initially. After a while, you don't even care about the sex. But those first six months or whatever, after that, the reason is because your dopamine. It's, they call it the feel-good chemical in your brain. You get dopamine by just eating pleasure foods. Um, like a dessert, you'll get 150% dopamine rush. That's why you want more dessert. Nicotine, 225% nic uh, dopamine rush. Up to quick cigarettes, doing that for all that. Cocaine, 340% of 
increase of that rate. Heroin, 1100% of a dopamine rush. And then <coughs> crystal meth, 1200%. So, the guy that I used to do the talks with, he was an alcoholic. Uh, he played sports in high school and all that. And out of high school, and he was hit the bars when he was 21. And he tried every drug there was. Kind of a party here. He's an alcoholic. Guy at a bar. His friend says, You need to try this crystal meth. And that's usually how it starts with any drug. You don't trust strangers, you trust your friend, your neighbor, your relative, or whatever, somebody you know. The guy says, You've got to try this stuff. He says, I tried powdered nut. I snorted powdered nut. No, 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 crystal meth is different. So he goes outside smokes crystal meth, he comes back in and he says, this is what I've been searching for my entire life. Never touched another drop of alcohol. All he did was meth. He lost 80 pounds, 10 teeth, um, stole from all his relatives, the whole bit. He got arrested enough times, or now he's been 10 years sober. But it was you know, tough go. Another tidbit, the crystal meth that's going around, the shards, where you smoke it in the pipe. I had a middle school girl raise her hand and said, and I, I wasn't passing out at the middle school, <laughs> but I was talking about it. And the middle school girl says, you know, uh, you can snort crystal meth. I said, uh, no, you can't. I'm the expert, you're not. And she said, oh yeah, you can. All you have to do is take shard of meth, two quarters, put it in there, and grind it into a powder, and then you can store it. And this is a girl that was in eighth grade. And she's right. So, I mean, young people know a lot. Um, either through friends, you know, media, or whatever. Um, I do show this to young people because it does get their attention. The meth mouth. I basically hounded a dentist. I stalked him until he gave me photos. <laughs> Actually, I made it rest right by his house. And uh, I told him, hey, where's those photos you said you'd give me? Because I wanted photos of people from Omaha. I don't care about an LA guy, what he looks like. I want kids to see people that were in their school, in the Omaha community growing up and what they look like. So, when you smoke meth, you get dry mouth. And if I had dry mouth, you know, I'd drink water. These guys will drink pop, sugar food. They don't brush their teeth, um, and eat hard candy, and all that is rapid tooth decay. That's what causes it. We had a person that was using meth, you know, you hear about the people that start picking at things or get really obsessive. She was obsessive with brushing her teeth. Meth user, no cavities. She brushed her teeth 40 or 50 times a day. But generally, 99% of the time, you're going to have dental problems. So, um, here's uh, Dr. Shainer from Creighton. So these are the people from Omaha. So I show these and some kids, you know, so I tell them to close their eyes because here's the really bad one. And they close their eyes and then they peek and scream and then everybody opens their eyes. And then I say, this, this is from a from Omaha. Then I'll tell them, okay, now this time, seriously, close your stinking eyes. And they, they try, but they won't. And they, I did this at Creighton Dental School, a talk. You know, when I ask the average person, what can you do here? You pull the teeth. But you don't ask that to a dental student. If they gave you a long list of things that they could do to maybe save the teeth. <laughs> I also 
show kids, again, when you first take a drug, whatever drug it is, tobacco, alcohol, whatever, you're happy because you, you're trying something new. So I just tell kids, I'm going to show you pictures, but these people aren't happy anymore. And here's a perfect example of a girl. And she's not for long. And I tell the kids, does she look happy now? She's ruined her life. You only have one shot in your life. And this girl's from Iowa. If anybody remembers seeing this billboard, it was on Interstate 80 around 60th Street. You can Google it, Angela Patino. This is when she was, I think, 13 or 14. So the next year, she's uh, 15. Everybody looks a little bit older. Mm -hmm. And she dies like two weeks later. But I tell, tell kids, didn't she have any friends? Could somebody have told a teacher, somebody, hey, she's not looking good. The guy that did the talks with me, he lost 80 pounds. And he looked terrible. And he felt so bad that he tried to kill himself. And the gun didn't work. But he, People told me, you look terrible. What can I do to help you? Call the cops or shoot me. Those are my only two options. Um, and he gets arrested. So, um, but in this case, didn't she have somebody? So I tell kids, you know, if you see somebody that's going downhill, you know, talk to a teacher, staff, security, whatever. And, and kids kind of get that. This is a University of Nebraska Lincoln student. 